when we talk about the in-home presentation, you'll see on this next slide, um, I like for people to learn the organization of this presentation or the flow. Listen, there's lots of different ways to give a good, effective sales presentation when you're face-to-face -face with someone. Uh, this is by no means the only way to do it. And, and honestly, rather than worrying about every word I say, uh, I really want you to focus more on the structure, the way we organize this presentation. I'll break it down into nine steps. If you can learn the, 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 the organizational flow of this, you can always, you know, th this makes it very easy for you to learn how to give a good presentation. In fact, uh, I designed this presentation many years ago when I was in the field training salespeople because I needed to come up with a fast way to teach people how to go give an effective sales presentation. So I think after you go through this class today and I send you these slides, and you spend a little bit of time on this first slide, uh, I think you're gonna be able to see that you're really ready to give a presentation, okay? So we're just gonna go through a, a kind of a nine step process. The first step always starts with rapport building. And this is a very natural thing for everybody. I mean, I think even if I wasn't doing this training class, all of you have learned in your lifetime that, hey, if you meet a stranger for the first time, Take a minute and get to know them. You know, warm up with them a little bit before you get down to business. So this is a natural thing for us. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really require a lot of explanation, but I do want to point out a couple of key things about rapport building. First of all, rapport building is where we build trust. Trust is critical in the beginning of your sales presentation because as you start going through this, and particularly when we get to step four, which is the needs analysis, if you've done a good job building trust here in step one, you're gonna find that it's gonna be a real benefit to you when you start asking questions because people are gonna be more open to, 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 to respond to you and give you real information. So I always like to think about step one as being very essential and something that I wanna be very intentional about. One of the things that I think about when I think about building rapport is I think about it's really about talking to people about things that are important to them, okay? And so it's important to be observant. When I walk up to that house, let's say I'm out working my new homeowner list and I arrive at the address of a brand new homeowner. <clears throat> As I'm walking up to the uh, driveway, I'm gonna be observant of things like the license plate on the car. If they're a new mover, there's a chance they've moved from out of state. You may see an out of state license plate. Let's say you live in Texas, that's where you're working, and you and you and you you roll up the driveway and you see that they have Michigan license plate. Well, that gives you an automatic conversation starter. Hey, I saw your license plate. Are you did you folks just move here from Michigan? And that's an easy way to get into a conversation. Also, as I'm walking up the sidewalk, if I notice, let's say, a tricycle in the front yard, pretty good, that's a pretty good indicator that the folks there's probably toddlers in home. And, and I can use that as a conversation starter. When I first get in the house, I'm always looking for things on the walls, the way they've decorated their home. People decorate their home with, with personal mementos and pictures, things that are really important to them that they want you to take notice of. So if I, so if I go in and I, and I notice that somebody's got a family portrait on the wall, they put that there very intentionally because they want me to notice. Okay, so I want to stop and say, hey, that's a great picture. Is this your family? Tell me about them. And we can get into a conversation. If I notice that there's something like a trophy on a mantle, I'm going to stop and say, wow, that's a great looking trophy you have over there on the mantle. What did you win that for? And we're going to have a conversation about that. So just remember that rapport building is about finding things to talk about that are important to the homeowner. Okay, now it's very important when I first get in that I take control. That's another important part of the rapport building. The key to taking control is that you need to be the person asking the questions. The person asking the questions is the one that's in control. So make sure that when you ask a question, you want to be a good listener, but as soon as they wrap up their answer, be ready with your next question. If you allow too much of a pause, they're going to take control by starting to ask you questions. We do not want them to take control because the questions they're going to ask are generally going to be questions about what's this going to cost. 
And we're nowhere close to being ready to have that conversation. So stay in control, be the one asking the questions. It's also important that we don't jump into selling too quickly. Okay. Now I could be out knocking on doors and, 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 and they'll agree to see me and I get in. I still don't want to jump right into selling. Slow down once you get in the house. Start asking some questions. Warm up with them a little bit. And stay away from doing any selling until you've had a chance to build a little rapport. So don't pull out your, your sales visual. Don't start talking about your packages. Talk about them. Ask questions about them. Now, just so you know, not every situation you're going to be able to do this for three to five minutes. Some people, because you caught them, off guard, they're going to want you to move a little quicker. But in an ideal situation, I want to try to try to get about three to five minutes in rapport building. This is always easier if you have a preset appointment. If you come, like let's say it's a referral and it's a preset appointment, you know, it's a lot easier to do this. Sometimes when you're out canvassing and you get into the house, you, you know, they're expecting to move a little quicker. But to the best of your ability, you want to shoot for three to five minutes. I have found that when I do less than three minutes of rapport building, um, I, I don't always have the trust built that I need. By the same token, if I, if I have somebody who's really chatty and, and we get beyond five minutes, I have to be very careful because now I'm starting to cut into my valuable selling time. So three to five minutes, that's really my goal. Now, when I've been there for three to five minutes and I sense that we warmed up, they're starting to like me, I can feel a little bit of trust has been developed. I want to have a very definite transition to get me from step one to step two. Uh, here's the transition that I do every time. When, I, when I've been there three to five minutes and I feel like we've got a good warm up, I'm going to take a quick glance at my wristwatch. I'm going to look up with a smile and I'm going to say, hey, I want to thank you folks for allowing me the opportunity to come in and talk with you. I know you're busy and I also have some families I need to go see. So if it's okay with you, I, I'd like to go ahead and get started. So it's really simple. Thanks for letting me come in tonight. I know you're busy. I'm also busy. If it's okay with you, I'd like to get started. Now, the reason I use that transition is because it communicates a lot of really powerful ideas. First of all, when I say, hey, I know you're busy, that tends to relax people. One of the reasons people sometimes are hesitant to let you in is because they don't know how long this is going to take. People's time, that's their most valuable asset. And so I want to make sure to let them know that I'm conscious that they're busy. That always tends to settle people down. And then when I say that I also have people to go see, what I'm communicating there is that I'm successful at this. Other people want to see me as well. See, people want to do business with people who are busy. They want to do business with people who are successful and have a product that other people also want. Think about if you drove up to a restaurant during peak hours, if there were no cars in the parking lot, what's your first thought? Well, it's probably that it must not be a very good restaurant because they're not busy. So people want to do business with busy people. And then when I say, if it's okay with you, I'd like to get started, that sends a signal that this is not my first rodeo. This is not the first time I've done this. And, and people like working with people who are professionals. It lets them know that I have a framework. I have a, a process. And all they need to do is sit back and relax and let me take control. So thanks for letting me, you know, you know, three to five minutes, look at my wristwatch or my phone, look up with a smile. Hey, I want to thank you folks for allowing me the opportunity to come in and visit with you tonight. I know you're busy. I've also got some families I promised I'd come see tonight. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to go ahead and get started. And they almost always will say, yeah, that sounds great. And then, then we're going to move into step two. Before I go to step two, though, any questions anybody wants to ask about this first step, about this rapport building? Any questions at all? <clears throat> Just come off mute if you have a question. It, it makes sense to everybody, right? So let's go to step two. Step two is where we set the agenda. <clears throat> Here's how that agenda sounds. Mr. And Ms. Smith, first thing I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about our company. I'd like to tell you about ADT and who we are. Then I'd like to ask you some questions about you folks so I can better understand what your concerns are. After that, we're going to take a quick walk around your house, both inside and out, 
so we can make sure that we identify and talk about any vulnerabilities or potential areas of concern. Once we get done with that, we're going to come, come sit back down, and I'm going to design a couple of options for you. I'm going to let you folks choose the one that you think's best. Then we're going to go ahead and get you scheduled for an installation date that fits comfortably into your schedule. Does that sound okay to you? So first I'm going to tell you about us. Then I'm going to find out about you. We're going to take a walk around your house. I'm going to design a couple of options, let you choose the one that's best. Then we get you scheduled for installation. Does that sound okay to you? So it only takes about a minute, and it's a simple agenda. Now, the reason I set that agenda for people is because I want them to know what to expect. And, and again, I'm continuing with the theme of letting them know that I have a process. That way, that they can simply relax and participate. They don't have to come up with anything. It's pretty obvious to them that I know what I'm doing, okay? But it also has a third component, and that is that it's very assumptive. It makes it sound like I expect that you're going to sign up tonight. And guess what? I do expect they're going to sign up tonight. Why do I think that? Well, it's very easy. You know, when I think about most people's home, that's their most valuable asset. And the people who live there, those are the people they love and care about the most. And then I think about to protect and secure their home and to protect their family is going to cost about $2 a day less than what they would pay for a cup of coffee. So why wouldn't they sign up for $2 a day? Are you kidding me? So I believe everybody's going to sign up. Now that's my belief. But what I'm doing here by being assumptive is I'm transferring that belief to them because that's what selling is. Selling is the transference of feelings and beliefs designed to help the other person get what they want. Listen, they let me in their house for a reason. They wouldn't let me in if they didn't have an interest. So they want something. There's some pain point that they're trying to get relief from. There's some problem that needs solving. There's some opportunity that they want to take advantage of. Okay. And so when I come in, they definitely want something. So I'm going to transfer feelings and beliefs to them to help them get what they want. Now I could come in and say, listen, you know, we're going to do a walk around your house and then we'll sit back down and I'll, I'll go over a couple of different options. And if you folks think that you'd like to move forward at that point, you can just let me know. You know, I could take that approach. But that approach says that I'm not sure that they're going to want to walk, move forward. See, I want to be 100% sure they're going to move forward. And all you need to remember is that for $2 a day, they can protect the most valuable asset and the people they love and care about the most. And you can be assumptive as well. So transfer that strong feeling. Now, <clears throat> one thing I want to mention to you. If you're strong like this and you set that expectation that you think they're going to sign up, you're very assumptive, there, are, there is going to be a small percentage of the population that's going to push back on you, okay? There's about 15% of the people that you're going to do this with that, are, that, that have an unhealthy view of the selling process. You see, they've had a bad experience with a salesperson in the past, or maybe it's just the way they grew up. But, you know, somehow in their mind, they think that the way this game is played is that if, if I'm able to sign them up, I win. And if they can keep me from signing up, they win. Now, that's just absolutely ludicrous. Listen, they have a problem they won't solving. And if I'm successful at helping them solve the problem, we both win. But, again, I'm just telling you, about 15% of the people out there have this unhealthy view of selling. And those people, when you do what you saw me do here, they're going to stop you. And they're going to push back. And it's going to get just a tad bit uncomfortable for a moment. Okay? And you've got to be prepared for that. And you've got to learn how to deal with that, 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 that tension that's created so that we can move forward. And here's how that's going to go. When I say, then I'm going to schedule installation date that fits in your schedule. Does that sound okay to you? They're going to say, well, hold on here a second, Joe. We, we weren't planning on making a decision tonight. We just wanted to hear what you've got. Or they might say, well, Joe, you know, we're just not the kind of people that make decisions on the spot. We, we want to get your quote, and then we're going to call two or three other companies and, and do a comparison. Or, you know, Joe, you know, we appreciate that, Joe, but we're not going to be able to make a decision tonight because we always like to shop around or, or something like that. They're going to push back. 
And you know what? They always feel uncomfortable as soon as they say it. They push back and then they feel bad because I've been a nice guy up to this point. And they feel a little bit awkward. So what I've got to do is I've got to be prepared with how to deal with that. And here's how I deal with that. <clears throat> when they say, well, Joe, we just, we're not going we're, we're, we're to make a decision tonight. We just want to hear what you've got. I always smile. Smile is the best thing you can do. Just go, hey, that's no problem. I just smile and say it's no problem. I go, hey, that's no problem. And then I say, two things I can promise you, Mr. Ms. Smith. Number one, whatever you folks decide to do, that's going to be your decision. And number two, I promise you, whatever you decide to do tonight, you're going to be comfortable. Does that, does that seem like a fair, does that seem fair to you? And they always say, oh yeah, that sounds good. And, and it, it's just enough to take the tension out of the room so I can move, move ahead. So if they push back, you just say, hey, that's no problem. Big smile. That's no problem. Two things I promise you. Number one, Whatever you folks decide to do tonight, that's going to be your decision. And number two, whatever you decide, I promise you, you're going to be comfortable. Does that seem fair? They're going to say yes, and then we can move forward. Okay, any questions about how I set the agenda or how I handle somebody who pushes back? Any questions you want to ask about that? Everybody good so far? So we do a warm-up for three yep. to five minutes. And then we spend about a minute setting the agenda, let them know what to expect. Then we go to step three. Now, step three is where we tell them the ADT story. It sounds something like this. You know, Mr. Ms. Smith, when I first came in tonight, you mentioned that you had heard of ADT, right? And they'll say yes. And I say, if you don't mind, tell me a little bit about what you know about our company. Now, when I ask that question, people typically tell me one of four things. They say, well, we know you're a big company. Or they might say, we know you've been around for a long time. Sometimes they'll say, uh, we know you have one of those little blue yard signs. And they might even say, we know somebody who has your service. But I've never heard people tell me much more than that. And it's important to start there because everybody's heard of ADT. It's one of the 100 most recognized brands in the world. So when I say, uh, tell me what you know, everybody's heard about us but they don't really know what makes us different from all the other companies out there. And I'm getting ready to tell you, but I always start by setting you up. If you don't mind me asking, tell me what you know about our company. And then after they tell me, I say, well, it sounds like you know a lot about our company, but let me share a few things with you that maybe, uh, uh, excuse me one second. Uh, excuse me, one second, clear my throat. But let me, let me share with you a few things that maybe you don't know about our company. For example, you may not realize this, but we've been around for 146 years. That's a really long time, right? And if you think about companies that have been around forever, companies like Ford Motor Company or General Electric or even Coca-Cola, none of those companies were here 146 years ago when we started. But that's not the reason people choose us. There's a, there's a lot of other reasons why people choose us, but I want you to understand that the original name of the company was American District Telegraph, which means we were here before there was ever a telephone. And one of the reasons why I think we've been so successful is this is all we've done for 146 years. For 146 years, the company stayed in their lane, focusing on what matters most to people, protecting what, what the, you know, protecting their homes, their businesses, and their families. Today, ADT has over 6 million customers. In fact, we're five times larger than the number two company. You could take the next 10 companies in our business and combine all of their customers, and we still have more customers than the next 10 companies combined. So why do so many people choose ADT over anyone else? Well, for starters, we have six company-owned interconnected central monitoring stations located around the country. They're all right here in the United States, and we own all six of them. Now, our competitors, they all have one monitoring center, and in most cases, they don't even own their monitoring center. It's a third-party contractual obligation. And so what's important about that is, let's say that you have a natural disaster, like the wildfires in California or maybe uh, an inclement weather event like the hurricanes down in the Gulf, or let's say coronavirus. 
if anything was to protect, anything was to prevent the workforce from getting into the monitoring center, you could be compromised. But not with ADT. With ADT, if something happens in, to one of our monitoring centers, we can simply flip a switch and we can reroute your monitoring to any one of the other five U.S.-based monitoring centers so that we can make sure that you're protected. See, at ADT, when we say we're always there, we really mean that. Our competitors can't make that claim. So that's one of the big reasons people choose us, is the, the interconnected company-owned monitoring centers. Another reason why so many people choose us is our customer service. We have 17,000 U.S. employees dedicated to serving our customers. When you call into ADT, your call is going to be taken by a live operator. There's no press one, press two, press three. It's a live operator. And our track record is we answer 90% of all calls, two rings or less. That's amazing in today's world, right? Two rings or less, a live operator. And if you're calling about service, 70% of all service calls get handled the same day or next. And we never charge our customers extra for same day service. Listen, there's a lot of companies that can make a really good case for why you should become their customer. But what's it going to really be like once you sign up with them? Well, with ADT, you're going to get the best five-star service, the, the best-in-class service. And so that's a big reason why people choose us. In fact, 90% of the Fortune 500 companies and even the U.S. government choose ADT to do their monitoring. Those companies could go anywhere, but they know that with ADT, they're going to get the kind of service that they need and expect. Another reason why people choose us is our industry-leading guarantees. For example, we have a theft protection guarantee that says, if you were to get broken into while you're our customer, we'll reimburse you up to $500, whatever your out-of-pocket homeowner's insurance deductible is. And believe me, we don't pay that very often because we just don't have that many situations. Our customers just don't get broken into. In fact, you're 10 times less likely to experience a break-in just having our system. We also have something called a relocation guarantee that says if you relocate, you can take your equipment with you, call us when you get to the new location, pay us a small fee, we'll come, up, come out, reinstall your equipment, and you can continue at your new location. In fact, if you've been with us for at least two years, just leave your equipment where it is, and we'll give you new equipment free at your new location. And we also have something called a satisfaction guarantee. Our competitors will all give you three days to change your mind. But at ADT, we go beyond that. We give you a full six-month satisfaction guarantee. And what that means, if at any point during your first six months you become unsatisfied with our service, all we ask is that you let us know what the problem is, Give us an opportunity to make it right. And if we can't fully satisfy you, we'll give you back every penny you paid for your first six months. Now, let me ask you this question, Mr. Ms. Jones. Doesn't ADT sound like the type of company your home and family need and deserve? And you should get a yes there when you ask that question. Now, let me stop for just a second and say that the difference between what I do and what a rookie does is a rookie goes in and says, have you folks heard of ADT before? And everybody's heard of ADT. So when the homeowner says, yes, we know about ADT, the rookie skips over all this and goes right along with their selling. Not me. I'm going to take the five minutes to go through and build the value around the ADT story. Now, the good news for you is everything you heard me just say, I've got all of that written down and I'm going to send you a copy of that when I send you a copy of the slides at the end of all today. That way you can study up and learn the ADT story. But you see, if you tell a good ADT story up front, you're not going to hear when you get down to the end people saying, uh, well, we think we want to shop around. See, I'm overcoming the shop around objection right now. I'm going to give people the information they need so that they can make a good quality decision. But if you don't give them the information, how are they going to know? See, you know, I've always said to people, there's no way that you should ever lose a customer to a competitor. You know, the only reason I can imagine if you've educated them on the value and who ADT is, the only reason I can imagine they want to shop around 
is because somehow they think that they're going to get a better price somewhere else. Well, if I can ever get somebody to admit to that, I ask them, I say, do you think we could be around for 146 years and have 6 million customers? Five times as many as the number two company. Can we make those claims if we were overcharging our customers? And most people will think about that and go, no, I guess you're right, Joe. You're probably not overcharging your customers. Well, then if somebody else says that they can offer you everything we can to protect your family and home and they can do it for less money, what does that actually tell you? They'll think about it for a minute and say, well, I guess it probably means that I'm not going to get everything with them that I would get with you. And I go, well, that'd be my guess. And then they always ask, well, Joe, what am I not going to get if I go with this other company? I always smile and say, I have no idea, but I know this. For a couple dollars a week, I wouldn't sit up at night sleepless worrying about what I didn't get when I decided to protect my family and home with my number two choice. Is that something that you really want to do? And they'll go, yeah, when you put it like that, Joe, you're right. I don't want to do that. My, my, my home and family is just too important. So we know, being on the inside of the industry, that people can market things and make it sound like it's really inexpensive. But when you sit down to do the paperwork, here's what I've learned. Everybody costs about the same. It's just that with ADT, you just get so much more. So don't let customers make a bad decision educate them on the ADT story. Any questions anybody wants to ask about this step before I move on? Hopefully, hopefully you see the value in what I'm talking about here. Take the five minutes to really go through this. The customer deserves to know why ADT is a better choice. Okay. Uh, Joe, just a quick yep. question. Did you just sure. memorize that over time just from repetition of doing this over and over or do you kind of get a general sense of the points and just you know say it how you say it yeah listen you're going to have to practice it but yeah i mean obviously i only give the presentation a couple times a month because i do this in-home presentation every other week uh but the but but i but i but i've been in front of thousands of customers knocked on thousands of doors trained hundreds of salespeople. And so, yeah, I have taken the time to, to master my craft. And so if nothing else, I want you to be inspired by that and, and realize that if you're going to really serve people, you owe it to the consumers that you're going to serve to be at your very best. I never take lightly the opportunity I have when I get face to face. When a family, when a family gives me the privilege of having an hour of their time or 30 minutes of their time or whatever they're willing to give me, when, when, I, when I'm granted that privilege, I never take that for granted. I'm going to be my very best, which means I'm going to master this so that I'm good at my craft. And that's what I want you to take away from this. Does that make sense? Sure does. Thank you. You bet. Great question. Okay. We ready to move to step four? Any questions on step three? Step four is the most important part of the whole presentation because step four is where you are going to find out why they let you in their house tonight, okay? Step four, you're going to let them talk 75%. You're going to talk 25%. You're going to have a, a pad of paper out, and you're going to be listening and taking notes. You ask questions, you listen to the answer, you take notes. That's what's going on in step four. There's five questions that you're going to ask in step four. Memorize these five questions. Uh, first question is, have you, have you ever had a home security system? Second question, have you or anyone you love ever been the vic victim of a burglary? Third question, have you or anyone you love ever had a home fire before? Fourth question, what about medical assistance, such as having to call for an ambulance? And finally, are you aware of all the new things home security systems can do today, which gets into the video surveillance and the home automation? Each of these five questions can be answered yes or no. If the customer answers yes, you're going to ask some follow-up questions to be able to, you know, really dig down and find out what their real motivations are. It's through those secondary questions that you're going to find out what the hot buttons are. Hot buttons are the, are the problems 
that they need solving. Hot buttons are the pain points they need relief from. Hot buttons are the opportunities that they want to take advantage of. Okay? That's what needs analysis is all about. Nobody is interested in buying the security system because they want to put plastic on the wall. They don't really want the equipment. What they want is relief from some pain, solution to some problem, or they want to be able to take advantage of some opportunity. You've got to find out what those hot buttons are before you ever start talking about your equipment. That's the rookie mistake that everybody makes. You walk in, start talking about equipment. Don't do that. Find out why they let you in the house. There's a reason, I promise you. And this is why it's so important to build trust in step one so that you can get honesty and you can get real good answers versus just a yes and no. Some of these questions they're going to answer no to. When they answer no to it, you still have an opportunity to make a point. And you'll see how I do this when we role play this. Uh, Jen, can you come off mute for a second and role play this with me? Sure. Okay, so here we go. Jen, now that I've told you a little bit about us, I'd like to ask you a little bit about you and some of your concerns. First of all, Jen, have you ever had a home security system before? No. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Jen, have you ever had a home security system before? No. Really? Wow, that's surprising. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you yep. this. Have you ever been the victim of a burglary? Now, stop right there for a second. So did you notice what I did when Jen gave me the no? I said, really? That's surprising. Now, the way I did, see, first of all, I can't, if she's ever had a home security system before, there's nowhere else to go. I've got to move to question two. But notice how I took a moment there and just said, really? That's surprising. Now, when I do that, there's a pretty good chance what I left Jen with is saying to herself, huh, this guy thinks maybe I should have had a security system before. And then she thinks to herself, maybe he's right. That's the transference of feelings and beliefs that we do. So if you ever get a no to any of these questions, let them know that you're surprised. See, like if somebody says they've never, they, they or no one they, that they, they love has ever had a burglary, I'm going to say, really, that's surprising. And, and that is surprising to me. I've been broken into twice. I have lots of friends have been broken into. If somebody says they've never had a home fire or know anybody who has, again, I've had a home fire. I'm, I'm surprised. In other words, these are things that happen to people. And just by saying that, I can kind of leave them thinking, well, maybe this is a bigger, a bigger problem than I think it is. So there's, there's, a, there's a psychology to the way we answer these questions. Now, Jim, you're a brand new homeowner, okay? You just moved into the house. Uh, you did have a system at your previous house. So I'm going to ask you the question again. You're going to say yes, okay? You ready? Yes. So, Jen, have you ever had a home security system before? Yes. Oh, okay. Tell me about that. Um, it was uh, with Vivint. <laughs> okay, um, okay. Yeah. And this was in your previous home? Yes. Jen, let me ask you this. What was the original reason why you decided to get a security system? Um, to protect the home from crime because it, it had a, um, the neighborhood had a high rate of crime. I found out after I moved in at that home um, and, you know, and a new baby. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. How did it make you feel when you first found out that there was a high rate of crime in that neighborhood? Um, kind of uh, um, on edge. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever know anybody personally who maybe experienced a break-in in that neighborhood? Um, yes. Okay, okay. And um, let me ask you a question. When you made the when you made the decision to get the security system, do you feel like that was a good decision? Did it work? Did it did it provide you with the peace of mind that you were you were hoping to get? It did, yes. That's great. That's great. And I heard you... a lot of great things about ADT, and w which is why I'm talking to you. Gotcha. Versus gotcha. the the security I had. <laughs> now you mentioned that the other reason why you thought to get that system was because you had a new baby. Um, I suspect your baby is now turned into a child. <laughs> Well, in reality, um, a grown adult, but yes. 
Okay, okay. So, so that, that and that was important to you then. Listen, is, are there any new reasons today why you're interested in getting a security system that might be different from those original reasons back when you moved into that neighborhood? Um, well, I like the, all the smart features where you can, um, you know, have the app on your phone and see what's going on inside your home or, um, you know, get an alert if an unwanted person tries to break in or something like that. Yeah. 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 And and what about from a security standpoint, are you still, still wanting that peace of mind from knowing that, you know, you're not going to have a problem because you have a system? Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. So let me just pause here. That's great, Jen. You can go back on mute. Um, I had no idea what Jennifer was going to say and it didn't matter. That's the beauty of these questions. You go with whatever they say to you. So when I said, have you ever had a home security system? She said, yes. I said, what? Tell me a little bit about that. That's a way to be non-directive. See, what I don't want to do is I don't want to lead her down a path. I want her to talk about whatever she wants to talk about. She could have said, oh, yeah, I had one, and it didn't work very well. I had a lot of false alarms. She could say, I had one, and I thought it was a waste of money. I, I'm not afraid of anything. I just want to hear about it. But in her case, uh, you know, she had a good experience. And, and you saw how I started asking questions like, what was the original reason you got it? Are there any new reasons today? And see, just by asking those questions, I was able to start to identify hot buttons. Like uh, what was one, of, anybody, what was one of the hot buttons we heard her say? What was, what, what hot buttons did you hear when we listened to her? Anybody? Hopefully you were listening. That there was um, high crime. She, she had just had a new baby. But what, what are the hot buttons related to today? Remember I asked her, I said, well, how about today? Are there any new reasons? Because the baby is no longer a baby, right? The baby's now an adult. So, you know, are there new reasons why you're interested in the security system? Where, where did she immediately go to? What did she start talking about? The quality of, the quality of ADT and the smart, smart. And the smart system. Yeah, she started talking about video and automation. And she started talking about wanting to get stuff on her phone. So those are hot buttons. That tells me that's what, you know, that's what she's interested in. Now, a question I didn't ask that I should have asked is, now that I'm thinking about it, is did you have those smart home features on your previous system? Which we already know the answer would be no to that because, you know, between the time her baby became an adult, that system was old, right? So, I, you know, I could have asked that question. So you, you get the idea. Start with, have you had a home security system? If they say yes, say, tell me about that and listen to what they talk about. Ask some probing questions. Get them to talk the things will bubble up. Same thing when we get to the next question, I would say, now, now I, I would have said it like this. Now, Jen, you mentioned that you knew somebody that had been broken into in your old neighborhood. Tell me a little bit about that. And then she could have started telling me a little bit about it. And I might've said, uh, you know, were the people home when it happened? Did they lose anything? Did they ever catch the people who did it? As I start asking those questions, she's going to relive that experience which is going to remind her how important it is to make sure that doesn't happen to her today. When I ask her about has, has she or anyone she knows or loves ever had a home fire, there's a good chance she's going to know somebody who's had a home fire. We're going to talk about that. The point is, by the time I get done with these five questions, it normally takes me about 15 to 20 minutes to work through these five questions. If you get through these five questions in, in, in two seconds flat, that means you didn't build enough trust or it means that you're not being patient. Okay. Take your time, ask questions, spend about three minutes on each question and that's 15 minutes. You can't spend too much time here. Take lots of notes as you hear these hot buttons, look for pain points, look for opportunities, look for problems that need solving. Okay. And they'll give you that. Then when you go out and do the walkthrough and start showing pictures of the equipment, you can connect it to what's important to them. Does that make sense to everybody? So critical. Yes. Now think about this. You know, I, I did three to five minute warm up. I spent a minute setting the agenda. I spent five minutes going for over the ADT story, and then I spend 15 minutes doing needs analysis. I've been in the house for 30 minutes. 
and I have yet to talk about the equipment or any packages. When I watch rookie salespeople, within three to four minutes, they got the product brochure out. And then they wonder why people want to think about it. It's because they didn't set it up. They didn't do the right work. They're like a doctor that when you come to see the doctor about a stomach ache, the doctor immediately starts prescribing a medicine to you. See, the pro does diagnostics first before they do prescription. You got to do diagnostics first. I mean, what kind of a pro would do, would do prescription without diagnostics? A lazy one? An inexperienced one, maybe? But, but not a pro. A pro always does diagnostics first. You have to. You have to. You got you to gotta find these things out first. Listen, not everybody's going to let you go at this pace. Sometimes they're going to push you through, and you're not, you, you do the best you can. But you always start with a game plan, okay? You always start with a game plan because, you know, you, as, what would Mike Tyson say? You know, it's good to have a game plan, but it all changes when you get punched in the mouth. Well, listen, sometimes you get in the customer's house, they won't let you do what you need to do. You do the best you can. But your goal is to follow this process because this is the process that will allow you to help that customer the best. And see, that's my mindset. I'm here. I'm here at your pleasure. You invited me in. Okay. And, and I'm here to help solve a problem for you. And I need to do, I need to follow my process in order to be able to do that. Now let's do one more step and then we're going to do the walkthroughs. Here's how step five sounds. <clears throat> Mr. And Ms. Smith, we're getting ready to go out and do a walkthrough, both inside your inside and out, so we can identify all the vulnerabilities and talk about all the concerns. But before we do, I want to take a quick minute and tell you about how I go about designing a system for you. First and foremost, my goal is just to get the system in here and get the yard sign planted outside, get some window decals on your most uh, vulnerable windows because I believe that the number one thing our system is going to do is deter crime. You see, when we put a system in your house and put that yard sign out front, we know that you're going to be 10 times less likely to be broken into because people know you have a system. So deterrence is the number one thing we want to do. Number two, we can't guarantee you won't be broken into. And so for that reason, we want to make sure that we're going to put, uh, you know, we, we can't guarantee you won't be broken into, but what we can guarantee is that if you do, we can minimize loss. And so for that reason, we're going to want to put sensors on all your doors, the exterior doors. Okay. Because we know who, we know that 95% of all break-ins are going to happen at the doors. The people who break in, they're young people between the ages of 15 and 25. Okay. They usually live within a mile of you, so they know when you come and when you go. They're going to target you when they think you're not home, generally during the daytime. They're going to come to your most secluded door, normally your back door. They're going to kick that door in. Make no mistake about it. They're not going to carry step ladders. They're not, they're not breaking glass and crawling through windows. They're just going to kick your door in. And when they kick that door in, they're looking for four things. They're looking for guns, jewelry, cash, and electronics. But at your house, because we're going to have sensors on those doors, the instant that door opens, that 85 decibel siren that we have is going to start blasting, and that's going to scare them off, because there's no way they're going to go in your house with that siren going off, knowing that some neighbor next door is going to look out the window, and they're going to be spotted. So while we can't guarantee that you won't be broken into, we can, we can minimize your loss to maybe just some damage to your door. Number three, under no circumstances do we ever want you to confront a bad guy in your house. And so for that reason, our system is going to call ADT so we can dispatch the authorities. You see, it's the authority's job to confront the bad guys. So if you do have a break-in, whether you're home or not, we want to make sure to get the authorities out there so they can do the confrontation. Number four, you know, we talk about, you know, break-ins and about guns, jewelry, cash, and electronics. All those things are things we can replace. But the things that we can't replace are your life, your family's life, and the life of your pets. And for that reason, we're going to talk about fire and life safety protection because that protects the things that we can't replace. And finally, we're going to leverage today's latest technology so that you can observe and manage events in and around your home even when you're not home. 
and that's using our command and control suite of services. We're going to talk about how you have that remote connectivity to your home that we've already spoken about. Now, let me just say this to you. As we walk around your house tonight and we design this system, you know, I'm going to be pointing out a lot of things to you, Mr. Ms. Smith, that you can do on your own, things that you can do that have nothing to do with my system. And the reason I'm going to be pointing these things out is because in the unlikely event you choose not to become my customer tonight, it is my goal to make sure that the time we spend together is some of the most valuable time you've ever spent when it comes to protecting the things that matter most to you. Is, would that be a fair thing? Would, would that be okay with you if I point out some things you can do on your own? And they're going to always say, oh, yeah, that would be great, Joe. And I'm going to say, great. Now, what I need for you to do is to uh, take me to the door in your house that you and your family use most often. Let's go take a look at that exit entry door. And then we're going to get up. We're going to go start the walkthrough. Now, before we do that, I just want to point out what I just did there. I just gave them a quick overview of my system design objectives. And I also made it very clear to them, I'm going to, you know, in the event they don't become my customer, this is going to be very valuable to them. You know, I want, I want to build value even if they don't become my customer. And that always, you know, that always builds a reciprocity with that customer where they really, really are going to be more connected to me. So let's go to the walkthrough. Now, I always start the walkthrough at the exit entry door because that's where we're going to mount the panel. Remember, we talked about that if you were on my class Tuesday, introducing command and control. You know, we're going to always build value around the panel, and we're going to build it, and we're going to talk about it right there at the exit entry door, which is the door that's going to have the 30-second delay on it, 30 to 45-second delay. Now, this family that I'm, that I'm working with, the Smith family, uh, they moved here from out of town. They're new homeowners. I was out knocking doors and, and, uh, of new homeowners, and they invited me in tonight. You know, when I walked in, I saw the family picture. I asked them about their family. I learned that, you know, Mr. Smith is in sales. He moved here for a new job. He works from home. He does outside sales. He doesn't really travel out, outside of the area. Uh, you know, he you know, works from home, so he's pretty much there every night. I found out that Mrs. Smith is a nurse, and she's already been hired by a local clinic. She has daytime hours, and she'll be working as a nurse. I found out that their oldest child, their son, is in high school, and the youngest daughter, she's in middle school. I also found out they had a little pet chihuahua. Okay, so these are just things I learned by looking at the family photo and asking questions. So now I'm standing there at the exit entry door. I'm showing them a picture of the alarm panel, and here's, where I, here's how the conversation goes. So Mr. and Ms. Smith, who is the last person to leave home every day? Uh, you know, who's, who's the last person to leave home? Mr. Smith says, well, that would be me. I usually leave, uh, you know, to go run appointments. I go, great. And what time do you normally leave, Mr. Smith? He says, well, it depends on when my first appointment is, but normally I'm always gone by about 930. Okay. And Mrs. Smith, you've already gone to work? She says, yes. And the kids, they've already gone to school? They nod agreement. And I say, okay, so Mr. Smith, when you get ready to leave, you're going to go to the alarm panel and you're going to enter armed away because you're going away from the home. When you enter armed away, your panel is going to start beeping. It's going to go beep, 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 beep. And that's going to give you 45 seconds to exit through this door, close it behind you, and then your system is going to be active. Does that seem like something you could do? Mr. Smith smiles and said, yeah, I think I can handle that, Joe. And I said, yeah, I knew you could. And then I asked, now, who is the first person, who, person who's going to come home in the afternoon? <clears throat> Mrs. Smith says, well, that would be our daughter, little Sally. I say, okay. And then she says, little Sally comes home on a school bus about 3.30 in the afternoon. And I say, okay, so little Sally comes home to the empty house in the afternoon about 3.30 on a school bus. Now, when she comes home, uh, does she use this door? And they say, yes, she does. And I say, okay, great. So when little Sally opens the door and comes into the empty house, she's going to be greeted with panels saying beep, 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 beep. And it's, going to, and it's going to tell her two things. First of all, it's going to say, come on in, little Sally. Uh, relax. The house is secure. It's just like it was when Dad left this morning. There are no bad guys hiding under the bed or in the closet. You're safe. And it's also saying to her, come over to the panel, enter your four-digit code, and disarm the system. 
Now, is that something little Sally can do? Could she put a four-digit code in and hit disarm? Mrs. Smith said, yep, she could do that. I said, okay, great. And I said, now, let me ask you all this. When little Sally comes home every afternoon to the empty house, does she, does she reach out and notify you somehow by maybe a phone call or a text or an email? Does she let you know she's home safe? They look at each other and say, well, she's supposed to, but she doesn't always remember to do it. And I say, yeah, I know. I used to have teenagers. I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, here's what you're going to love about our system is that when she comes into this empty house and she puts in that four-digit code to disarm the system, we can automatically text you or email you and let you know that she's home and she's safe. Mr. and Ms. Smith look at each other. They look back at me and they go, wow, that's incredible. And I say, yeah. So what would you like? Would you like to have an email or a text? They say, well, text would be great. I write that down because remember, I'm taking notes. Then I say to them, Mrs. Smith, at what point in the afternoon if she wasn't home? You said she gets home at 3.30, but at what point in the afternoon if she wasn't home and you knew about it, would you start to worry? She says, well, if she went home by 4.30, something must be wrong. Well, here's something else you're going to love about our system. We can not only set you up to get a notification when something happens, we can notify you if something doesn't happen. We can set up a remote a notification that says, if she doesn't disarm the system by 4.30, we can send you a text letting you know she's not home. They look at each other, they look back and they went, wow, that's incredible. And I said, yeah, but it gets better. I say, see right over here, we're gonna mount one of our interior cameras right here looking at this door and it has a motion activated sensor it will record a 30 second video clip when she comes home in the afternoon. We can put that in the cloud and send you a link. You can access it right on your phone and you can see who she bought home with her in the afternoon. They look at each other, they look back at me and they go, Joe, this is incredible. And I said, you're right, it is. And we're just getting started. Now let me stop the role play for a second. See how I built value around the panel? I didn't tell, tell you who the manufacturer was and what all the lights and buttons do. What I did is I showed you how this panel solves problems you have. See, I know what kind of problems a latchkey kid parent has because I used to be one. Listen, there's not a parent out there who has a middle school daughter who comes home to an empty house on a school bus that doesn't worry about things like their safety when they come into an empty house and worries about what goes on in the house in the afternoon when they bring friends in that maybe the parents don't know about. These are real things. Is it worth $2 a day, less than the price of a cup of coffee? Is it worth $2 a day to a parent of a middle school daughter to know that your daughter got home safe and secure every day? I would tell you that it is. And you see, that's the key to selling is you got to stack up enough value on one side of the ledger to offset the cost of the service on the other side. But let me let you on a little secret. You only got to come up with $2 a day of value. And I just showed you $2 of value on one feature. Imagine if I show her 10 features. If I show this couple eight to 10 features, that, that solve problems that they have, pretty soon you're going to say, hey, Joe, we can't live without this. It doesn't matter what it costs. We can't live without this solution because how could we put a price on the safety of our daughter? This is what I talk about when I say build value. If you build value, people have to have your system. Now, the rookie just talks about all the bells and whistles and how great it is and then wonders why people want to think about it because they never really connected emotionally with the family. See, I'm going to connect with you emotionally. I can't do that unless I ask questions and learn what the hot buttons are. Does that make sense? Anybody got any questions about that? This is really important. This is what makes the difference. Okay, let me give you one more role play example. Osmond, can you come off mute and role play this with me? Sure, most definitely. You gonna be easy on me? <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> now, I gotta tell you up front, Osmond, 
all my lines are memorized. You're going to have to make your stuff up as you go. You okay with that? Yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. We could do that. Okay, very good. So here we go. So Osmond, I'm walking through the house with you, and we, we get to the master bedroom. I'm going to point up at the ceiling and ask you about what's on the ceiling. You're going to tell me it's your smoke detector, okay? All right, sounds good. You ready? You ready? Uh-huh. So here we go. So Osmond, what am I looking at here on the ceiling? Uh, that's my smoke detector. Okay, and Osmond, what's the what's the what's the purpose of the smoke detector? Uh, my assumption is it's there for in case there's a fire, it'll, it'll alarm me and my family. Yeah, maybe wake you up in the middle of the night if you're asleep, something like that. Yeah, definitely. So, Osmond, truthfully, when's the last time you changed the batteries? Uh, usually I don't change it unless I hear a beeping. <laughs> well, I appreciate your honesty. You know, most people tell me that same exact thing. Here's what my company would recommend you do. Change your batteries when you change your clocks. In other words, in the spring and in the fall, when you change your clocks for daylight savings time, change your batteries. Always keep fresh batteries. And here's why I tell you to do that, Osmond. You see, if you wait till the batteries start chirp until your smoke detector starts chirping, in addition to being annoying, the, the other thing is you only have about 20% life left in those batteries. Think about this. If a fire broke out in your house and your power was, was disrupted, the only thing that's going to make that smoke detector sound, you know, how loud it is and how long it's going to sound off is going to be totally dependent on the life of those batteries. Those batteries are going to be the difference between success and failure waking you up if your power was disrupted. And that's just too, too big of a risk to take on low, on low charge on batteries. So for that reason, can I get a commitment from you, Osmond, that when I leave sometime in the next 24 hours, you'll go ahead and change those batteries? Uh, sure. Very now good. that I know they're so important, I definitely will. Very good, very good. Now, Osmond, you mentioned earlier that one of the reasons we have smoke detectors is so it can wake you up in the middle of the night if there's a fire. Let, let's assume that it's the middle of the night, you're asleep, you and your wife are in your room, uh, the kids are in their bedrooms, all of a sudden your smoke detector goes off. Osmond, what's the first thing you're going to do? Um, going to get up, get my kids up as well try to look around and see where the fire is see if it's just a little thing i'll put it out myself but if it's in serious then i'm getting everybody out the house okay and then what are you going to do um well i'll go to my firebox and get out my cash and my emergency stuff okay uh but other than that uh then what are you going to do? I'm just going to sit out there and watch my house burn down, I guess. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not gonna do very much. I'll probably jump in a car and take off. Okay. Uh, very good. But I'm very not good. staying in the house. I know that. Now, Osmond, let me tell you what my company would recommend you do if a fire breaks out or, or if your smoke detectors wake you up in the middle of the night. Here's what my company would recommend you do. First thing you do, Osmond, wake your wife up and both of you get out of bed and get down on the floor. The reason I tell you to get down the floor is because when a fire starts, it generally starts as a so, slow smolder. And when those synthetic materials in your house start to heat up, they'll emit a toxic fume. And if you breathe those fumes, it can actually knock you unconscious. Eventually, it will kill you. In fact, mostly the medical examiners tell, you, tell us that when there's a fatality associated with a home fire, rarely, if ever, did the victim ever hear their smoke detectors go off. They were already unconscious. Okay, so the first thing you do is get down on the floor, get as low as you can. Now, I want you to crawl over to the bedroom door. Always close before you doze. Always sleep with that bedroom door closed. Put your hand on that door and make sure it's not hot. If it's hot, don't open that door, Osmond. Make sure that you and your kids all have two ways out of every bedroom, okay? You got to have a way out through a door and a way out through a window. So if that door is hot, we're not opening that door. But let's say in this case, the door is not hot. Go ahead and open the door and crawl out into the hallway. I mean, maybe it's a false alarm. Or like you said, maybe it's a small fire you can contain. But let's say you crawl out into the hallway and you realize that it's a fire that's bigger than anything you can contain. Go ahead and get your wife and get out of the house as quickly as you can. Now, one of the mistakes a lot of people make, you didn't make this mistake, but a lot of people make is they'll call 911 as their next step. Don't do that, okay? If you've ever called 911 in an emergency, you know that they've got to ask you eight to 12 questions before they dispatch. That's going to take a minute and a half to two minutes. You don't have that kind of time. 
In a house fire, the National Fire Prevention Association tells us that a fire will double in size every 30 seconds. That's right, uh, Osmond, every 30 seconds is gonna double in size, so you don't have time to call the authorities. Get you and your wife out as quickly as you can. Now, you did not mention a meeting place, so let's just say it's that big oak tree in the front yard that I saw when I drove up today. Let's make that the meeting place. You and your wife go to the meeting place and wait for your kids to join you. Train your kids that when they get out, no matter how they get out, come to the meeting place when they get there. That way you can count heads. There's nothing any, any more terrifying than to think about a parent thinking their kids are still in a, a burning house, running back in to try to save them, and the kids are out. They're in the backyard. So train everybody to come to that meeting place. That way you can count heads. Once you've counted heads, now it's time for you to call 911. Now I realize at this point, a lot more of your house has burned, but listen, we're interested in saving what we can't replace, which is your life, your family's life, and the life of your pets. Osmond, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it sure does. Okay, now let's stop the role play for a second. I wanna do a little bit of teaching, then we're gonna come back. I got one more thing to do here before we finish this, but let me do a little bit of teaching for a second. Remember back in step five when I said, you know, you know, you know, I'm going to point out a lot of things you can do on your own to protect your family and home, because in the unlikely event you choose not to become my customer tonight, I want to make sure that the time we spend together today is very valuable to you. Remember when I said that? Did, did, yeah. I, did I just live up to that? Yeah, you sure did. Yes. See, I went out and talked to you about your smoke detector batteries. I, I basically designed a fire escape plan for you. Why do I do those things? Well, it's not just because I'm a nice guy. I do those things because this is what I do. I'm in the life safety business. I'm in the business of protecting what matters most to people. I take that very serious. It's a mission for me. And people can tell. They can tell I'm serious about that. People want to do business with people who are real professionals. So I just want to just, I'm modeling some behavior here for you, but I want you to take this to heart. We're not there just to make a sale. We're there to save a life. We really are. This is serious business. Listen, Osmond may not buy my system, but if I do my job, it may make the difference for him and his family one day. See? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm an Eagle Scout. I was very fortunate that my parents got me into scouting as a, as a young man. And one of the most valuable lessons I learned from scouting is you always leave a campsite better than you found it. I always leave a family better than I find them. That, that's my commitment. Listen, if you, if you sign up with me tonight, that's a win for me. I get a commission check. Yeah, but you know what? I'm going to spend that commission within a week if I haven't already spent it. By the time I get it, right? But you're, you, the win is really for you because you're going to have the protection of our system for a lifetime. So just remember, it's more than just about making a sale. It's really about being serious about protecting people. Become an expert on your craft. Learn everything you can about protecting people and share that information with your customers. Okay? that That's why people sign up so easily with me and they might not sign up so easily with somebody who doesn't do some of these things. Okay. Because they want to be a part that, you know, they want to be my customer. They want to have a relationship with me because they know that, that, that I can provide value to them. Okay. So anyway, just, I won't, I'll get off my soapbox, but I just want to make those points to you about that. Now, also I want you to notice something else. Right there on your screen, it says build, need through scenario, create a scenario. So Osmond, what are you going to do when, when you hear the smoke detector go off? I created a scenario for him. And then I said, so what are you going to do? See, I put him in that scenario. This is called building value. I didn't try to sell him a smoke detector. I put him in a scenario and said, what are you going to do? And then I said, here's what our company would recommend you do. Now I'm going to do the final piece. I'm going to tell you how much better it would be if he becomes a customer of mine. So here we go. We're back in the role play. <clears throat> We're back in the role play mode. Okay, here we go, Osmond. So Osmond, let me tell you how much better this whole thing would be if you were my customer. First of all, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you hear that smoke detector going off, 
it's going to be the smoke detector we're going to put into your house. You see, you already have smoke detectors, and they, and they operate off of something called ionization, which means they react to flames, which is good. But the National Fire Prevention Association says you also need a different type. You need two types. You need something called photoelectric that operates off of the detection of a slow smolder, because that's how, that's how a fire starts. So my smoke detector is an early warning device that's going to pick up on a slow smolder. It's when you, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you hear your smoke detector, it's going to be the ones we put into your house. Plus, our system, our, our smoke detectors have the added value of connecting with your alarm system. So even if you're unable to hear the, hear the smoke detector or you're not even home, it's going to call ADT so they can dispatch the authorities. Think about your pets, Osman. Okay, if you're not home and your smoke detectors go off, not going to help your pets out a bit. But our smoke detectors will actually call ADT and let them know to send the, send, send the authorities. That can make the difference for your pets. Okay? So when you wake up in the middle of the night and you hear your smoke detectors going off, it's our smoke detector. First thing you do is wake your wife up. Both of you get down on the floor, get as low as you can, crawl to the bedroom door, put your hand on the door, make sure it's not hot. If it's not hot, open it, crawl out into the hallway. If you realize the fire's too big for something for you to control, go ahead and get you and your wife out. You know, go to the meeting place, wait for the kids to join you, count heads. And then just about the time you're counting heads, here comes the fire truck rolling up. Much quicker than if you waited till that point to start calling 911 yourself. Because you see, Osmond, while you were doing your job, we were doing our job getting the authorities there. Now, doesn't that sound like the type of protection your family need and deserves? Yes, definitely. That's how you build value. That's how you get people to see value in your system. Not by explaining how the thing works, but by showing them the problem and showing them the solution. And I'm going to use this type of approach throughout the entire home as we do the walkthrough. If I'm going to be selling you a doorbell camera, I'll probably start by saying, are you folks getting more deliveries today than you normally, than you used to get? And everybody's getting more deliveries. And I'll ask questions like, are you concerned that sometimes a delivery might sit on your porch for a couple of days because you didn't even know it was out there? Are you concerned that one of the neighborhood kids might vandalize and take that package off your porch? You know, we're going to talk about those things and we're going to build value around how that doorbell camera is a great, um, is a great uh, defense against the porch pirates. So no matter what piece of equipment we're talking about, I'm going to connect it to something that's important to them. Build value through the walkthrough. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Osmond. You can go back on mute. Um, let's jump to, let's jump to the, the presenting the options, step seven. So after I've done that walkthrough and I've built value on all the equipment I'm going to recommend, then we're going to come sit back down, like I said, and I'm going to design a couple of options. Listen, people love choices, but I never give them more than two. You give people more than two choices, they're going to be overwhelmed and they're going to want to think about it. So never give them more than two choices. <clears throat> and, and you should be able to know which two choices to give them based on what you did as you walk through the home. Okay, I'm always going to try to build value around automation, around video, certainly around security and around life safety so that I can offer all of that to them when I sit down, okay, to go over the options. So when I sit down in step seven to go over the options, I always pull out a blank sheet of paper, okay, and I draw a line down the middle and across the top, I write the name of the package I'm going to recommend. So in this case, I would recommend command and control, video and automation. And then I'm going to begin writing down a list of what they get. Keypad, siren, door sensors, motion, doorbell camera, you know, door lock, yard sign stickers. I'm going to mention professional installation. And I'm going to point out to them that this is about a $1,350 value. And then I'm going to point out to them that they get all of it for free just for signing up because of the promotion that we're running. All they'll have to do is take care of the monthly service, about $2 a day, $64.99. And I'm going to point out that that $64.99 also includes the quality service plan, which says that if they ever need service, 
All they do is pay a $25 trip charge. We cover all parts and all labor for as long as they're being monitored by ADT. So they're never going to be surprised with a large repair bill. That's built right into the monthly service. Also, they're going to receive an insurance disc, uh, uh, an insurance certificate that they can provide to their homeowner's company. Most homeowner's insurance companies will provide them with a discount because they have a professionally installed and monitored system. In some cases, that discount can be as much as 20% off their annual premium. That goes a long way to offsetting the cost of the monthly service. All they'll be responsible for is taking care of the monthly, uh, of the monthly service and a one-time activation fee of $199, which allows them to connect them to the police, fire, and medical authorities through ADT. Now, the other option we can give them is everything they see on the left side, plus we can add that fire protection. We can provide two of those fire communicators at $169 each. So for an additional $338, that's a one-time payment. We can go ahead and add the fire, that, that early warning device that will call ADT even when they can't. So Mr. Ms. Smith, let me ask you, of the two, of the two options here, with or without the fire prevent, protection, which way would you like to go? That's my closing question. Did you want it with or without the fire protection? And that's the question I ask. That's what we call a closing question. Whatever they say next, and by the way, rookie mistake number one is after you ask your closing question, you don't wait for them to respond. After you ask that question, you don't say another word. I don't care if, they, if they're having trouble coming up with an answer, you just smile, keep looking at them. I don't care if you got to sit there till, for three days, you don't say another word. Because that's the rookie mistake number one. If you jump back in and start talking, you're letting them off the hook. I've done my job at this point. It's now their time. Did you want it with or without the fire protection? When they finally say something, unless it's a, a clear no, I'm going to assume it's a clear yes, and I'm going to move forward to my order entry portal and start asking questions like address, phone number, email, things of that nature. Unless it's a clear no, whatever they say next is going to lead me to the portal where I'm going to start asking questions. So let me give you an example. Mr. Ms. Smith, did you want it with or without the fire protection? They look at each other. They look at me. Four seconds goes by. Five seconds. Nobody's saying anything. I'm smiling. And they look back at each other. Finally, Mr. Smith says, well, you know, I'm not sure, Joe, but, you know, that... I guess the fire protection, you know, I kind of know that, that that makes a lot of sense, that fire protection. Now, he didn't say sign me up, but he also didn't say I don't want to sign up. So I didn't get a clear no. Remember the rule. If it's not a clear no, I treat it like a clear yes. So here's my response to that. Hey, I think that's a wise decision, Mr. Smith. Now, I will need to get a little bit of information from you. Can you go ahead and give me the address here? Now, this is where I've got my portal open on my phone or my tablet, and I start filling in that information. Can you go ahead and give me the address here? Now, if Mr. Smith gives me that address, I just keep asking questions. We're done. We're moving forward. See, a rookie wants everybody to say, yes, please sign me up, but they don't always do that. A lot of times, you just have to move forward. But that's very important to understand. If it's not a clear no, move forward with a clear yes. Now, sometimes you will get a clear no, and it, it won't be a no, but it will be something like, well, you know, Joe, gosh, we just really need a little time to think about it. So it's more of a hesitation, but it's clear, right? I mean, you're not going to go straight to the address now because they're basically telling you they want to wait. You got to have a plan for that. Listen, if you're flying jet airliners, carrying passengers, Hopefully, when you went to flight training school, they taught you what to do if all of a sudden one of the engines stops, right? You got to have emergency procedure. On this slide here is my emergency procedure. Four steps. If they say they want to think about it, they want to hesitate, they want to wait and think about it a little bit, that's a critical point in the presentation. You've done a good job. They're on board. They're feeling bad, but they're just not ready to move forward. You got two choices. You can do something that's going to put them on the defensive 
or you can do something that's going to relax them. Because, again, they're feeling a lot of pressure. I always try to relax them. Agree and set them at ease. It goes like this. Well, hey, I understand, Mr. Ms. Smith. Listen, I can understand and certainly understand and appreciate the way you feel. This is an important decision, and you want to make the right decision, right? So I'm going to say something like that, something that makes them feel okay. Hey, I, I get it. Sure. If you folks want to think about it, I understand. I get it. This is, a, this is an important decision. You want to make it right. I got it. Now, when I do that, it takes all the pressure off and it relaxes them because now I'm not challenging them. They were expecting me to try to talk them into it. I'm saying, hey, I understand. Then I move to step two. Just to clarify my way of thinking, if you don't mind me asking, though, is the reason you folks want to think about it is, is, is what you want to think about is it whether or not you want to use ADT as the company to protect your home and family? I start asking questions like that. Hey, listen, I, I certainly understand and appreciate the way you feel. It's a big decision. It's an important decision. You want to make sure you make it right. I get it. But just to clarify my way, way of thinking, is the part that you're still thinking about or wanting to think about, is, is it whether or not ADT should be the company to monitor you? They'll probably say, no, no, no. We think ADT is the right company. You've done a good job explaining it. I say, okay, well, that's good. So is the thing you're still thinking about is about the equipment? Are you concerned that the equipment might not do its job? Oh, no, Joe, we know the equipment will do its job. Okay, great. So is it, um, is it the cost? Is it, is it the $2 a day? Is, is that maybe, uh, is that an issue for you? No, 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 we can afford that, Joe. That's not a problem. Okay, great. So if it's not ADT, it's not the equipment, it's, uh, it's not that, sounds like to me, it's just maybe, I don't know, is it just, you know, you just kind of want some time to think about it. It's not really anything in particular, is it? It's just, you're just wanting to think about it, right? And they go, yeah, you got it, Joe. That's it. Okay. Well, let me share with you, and then I'm going to start sharing some information with them. And if this is a, a real-life situation, I'm going to say, listen, let me share with you that, you know, o over time I work with a lot of customers, and, and, and I work with a lot of families just like yours who really, really care about protecting their family and home. And, and they really want to do that. And, 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 and it's important to them. And, and, and you know, I meet with them and, and, and they know that ADT is a good company and they like the equipment and the but it'll fit into their budget. But yet, just like you, you know, it's, you know, just kind of making that decision. Listen, we're all like that, you know. You know, humans are wired to be like water. We take the path of least resistance. If we don't have to make a decision, you know, why make it? And, and I'm sure you and I can both come up with tons of reasons why or, or examples of how we procrastinate in the past. But here's what I want to tell you. It's been my experience that when people put off a decision that's this important, you know, when I'm right here giving you the information, it, it's never easier the next day. In fact, tomorrow, you're probably not going to be as focused on this decision as you are today because, you know, life gets in the way. And my experience has been that when people hesitate, often it can be some time before they end up getting back to me and signing up. In some cases, it can be two or three years. And it always seems that when I hear from them next, it's after something bad's happened, you know? And, and, and I don't want to see that be the case for you folks. Listen, you know, I think that I've showed you a solution to some, some very important things that, that are important to you, let, let's go ahead and take advantage of this while you've got the information and while we, you're readily admitting there's not any particular reason to hesitate, let, let's go ahead and move forward. Let, let's, don't, let's don't wait until something happens. So did you, did you want me to go ahead and set up the installation for Thursday or Friday? Step four, close again. That's how you handle that. You just, you, you give them some new information and then you ask another closing question. And I can just keep re-going through this over and over and over. Sometimes you got to do that three or four times to get them to go ahead and make the decision. Okay. If there is something that's keeping them from making a decision, let's talk about it. I'm, I'm being very honest, but most people, if you've done your job, there's no real reason not to. So you got to have a way to deal with that as opposed to saying, sure, call me tomorrow. Because if you do that, you're going to find that a lot of people won't call you tomorrow. We don't want to let that happen. We don't want to let that happen. I think somebody just uh, has, has the upfront gone from 99 to 199. No, the upfront still $99. But if you remember, 
Um, you remember, uh, Phil, you know, on package number six, which is the video and the automation, on that particular package, uh, you know, I recommend to our dealers that we charge $199 because it's only a dollar more and they get both an automation and a video device. But again, check with your dealer on what the pricing policy is. They may allow you to do it for $99. But on that one particular package, I always ask for $199. So that's why I, that's why I ask that. Um, okay, great. Phil said that's great. Good. Okay. You fill out the portal, you run the credit, you schedule. By the way, if you need any help on how to do this, at 2.30 East Coast time today, I'll be doing a 30-minute training. Uh, make sure to come to that. Last two things that you always want to do after you get them scheduled, reassure them that they've made a good decision. Sometimes you have to, you know, kind of prompt them to move forward. And, you know, we talk a lot about the money right there at the end. You know, reassure them by taking the focus off of that remind them of the reasons why they're doing this before you leave them and always make sure that you ask them for referrals. The best way to ask for referrals is ask them, listen, if I send you a link to my landing page, can I get a commitment from you that you'll share that with some of your friends and family member? Let them know that, you know, shoot a text or an email out to them. Let them know that you become my customer. And if this is something that they might be interested, encourage them to call, reach out to me. And so make sure to do that. Let me check the chat feature here. Looks like I got a, a couple more chats just came in. Let me just clear that. See if there's anything. Uh, is that the same link for? Two, yep, two thirty. Uh, not this link here. There's a different link for that that you should have uh, with the. Um, you probably got a list of the training classes, and and you'll see one for for the portal, and and you'll go to that link. It's not the one we used this morning. No, it's a different one. And uh, shoot me a, a text or an email if you don't have it, and I can, uh, and I'll be glad to share it with you. Okay. <clears throat> well, we've got just a minute here. We're about to wrap up. Um, is, uh, is are there any questions about anything we've covered here? Any questions about anything we've covered here, or has this been helpful? And if so, how? It's been very helpful, and you're a very good teacher, Joe. Uh, very good. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you yeah, no I problem. Agree. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Any questions anybody wants to ask about? And so I'm going back to the organize here. I want you to memorize this process. You may not be able to do everything that I can do right now, and that's okay. You don't have to. But just, just keep working through these things. But just try to have that game plan so when you get in there, you know what you're going to do. Okay, so if you've been on my classes this week, Tuesday, you learned about the products, the packages and the pricing. Uh, Wednesday, you learned some strategies for going to market and finding some leads. Today, you learned what to do if you get in front of somebody. You really have enough information at this point to begin start making some presentations. Start with people that you know. Call them up and say, listen, I'm not going to ask you to buy anything, but let me come over and practice with you, you know. Who, who knows? They might be interested. They might end up signing up, but you can go practice with warm market. You know, we talked about that. Um, you know, start working those new homeowners in your area, you know, but, but you're ready to get started at this point. And come back next week if you want to learn how to do a phone sale, because next week on Thursday, I'll go through how to make the sale doing it by phone. Okay. So any last questions or comments before we wrap up?